Um, what I wanted to do today is, uh, my disclosures are shown, um, and I will be talking about some non-FDA approved therapeutic agents coming around, uh, is just give an update on PNH, and I'll try and move fairly quickly through it, what it is, uh, and then talk some about some of the newer treatments coming along. Uh, PNH, as the name suggests, is sudden in onset. It uh, occurs more at night or upon waking in the morning, and patients wake up with dark colored urine, uh, which scares them, and they get sent all over to urologists and everybody else before somebody realizes they're hemolyzing. About 40% of patients present with this classic uh, hemolytic picture, uh, but there's quite a lot of heterogeneity in how patients present. It is still very rare and unusual. It's acquired. It is, you're not uh, born with this. And it's characterized by a mixture of all sorts of things, including intravascular hemolysis mediated by complement, bone marrow failure with cytopenias that we believe is immune mediated, but not through complement, and then uh, a risk of blood clots. And there's incredible clinical heterogeneity amongst patients with PNH. I'll take some pictures from my university to divide the talk up. Um, Flow cytometry is still the diagnostic test for PNH. We do it on peripheral blood. If you do it on bone marrow samples, you get some nonspecific findings that can confuse the picture. Uh, it is recommended that both erythrocytes and either granulocytes or monocytes should be tested, in part because patients who are going through a lot of hemolysis, you may not pick up uh, uh, the disease on, on the erythrocytes alone. That's pretty rare, but it can happen. Uh, typically, we'll use monoclonal antibodies against GPI-anchored proteins, uh, such as CD59 or 55. And PNH blood cells are those that are missing these GPI-anchored proteins, uh, and the guidelines have been uh, issued by the Clinical Cytometry Society, uh, now suggesting that uh, patients who have a 1% uh, size are uh, suggestive of having PNH. The other test that's available is the so-called flare assay. This is a uh, protein that Rob Brodsky discovered that are, are described uh, with this assay. Basically, uh, from aeromonas, this aerolysin binds to the GPI anchor uh, rather than any specific antigen. Therefore, you get a larger signal-to-noise ratio and a much more sensitive test uh, And when it does this. Um, and we can use this only on granulocytes or monocytes because there's nonspecific binding of this protein to uh, some of the glycoproteins uh, on red cells. What causes PNH? Well, we're still trying to figure that out. There is clearly a mutation in the hematopoietic stem cell that leads to a defect in production of the GPI anchor, and I'll show you that in a second. But this mutation is not oncogenic. It gives no growth advantage to these cells. So there has to be something else that allows these mutant cells to become the dominant cell in the bone marrow. Most of the mutations occur in the pig A gene. Why the pig A gene? Well, it's the first step in making this anchor. But more importantly, it's localized on the X chromosome. So in the acquired state, it only takes one hit to knock out this protein. Males only have one X chromosome. Uh, females have lionized one. So uh, one hit, and you are knocking down this protein fairly severely, or knocking down the GPI anchor fairly severely. There are a lot of proteins missing in PNH, uh, especially these that are GPI anchored. This is just a partial list. Uh, CD55 and 59 are those that protect the red cells from complement, and these are the ones that we understand best. Whether these other proteins play any role in the pathophysiology of the disease, we do not know. And complement itself is a highly uh, evolutionarily conserved uh, part of our immune system. Uh, you can find uh, forms of complement down to the earthworm. It is activated in three different ways, through the classical pathway, through antibody antigen reactions, through the lectin pathway, and then through the alternative pathway that's always on uh, to some extent uh, in all our bodies. So there's always a little bit of complement activation going on, and any sort of stress, infection, surgery, can raise those levels quite clearly. There's a feedback loop that once you activate C3, uh, you turn the things on. There are, uh, there are proteins that will turn things off, and these are what are missing in diseases such as H A AHUS. Uh, but we all then go through C3 down to the C5, and C5 then uh, activates the terminal attack complex uh, through C5, C6, C7, C8, and C9, making pores in cells and causing lysis. So I mentioned there was something else that has to happen in patients with PNH, and we think this something else is what leads to the bone marrow failure syndromes. We can find PNH clones, at least to a small extent, in up to 50% of patients with aplastic anemia. Uh, we see a lot of bone marrow failure in patients with PNH. Uh, 
And uh, even in MDS, there are occasional PNH clones that suggest a higher response rate to immunotherapy. Um, about 93% of patients, when you look at them, have concomitant cytopenias. Uh, some of those are just anemia, but almost a third of them have pancytopenia, at least in this one study by Gerard Sosi that was published in Lancet. PNH clonal expansion is frequent in aplastic anemia. That is, after you treat the, uh, these patients with immunosuppressive therapy, they will later on have a clonal expansion of the PNH clone that will uh, eventually lead to clinical uh, signs of hemolysis. Uh, cytopenias, as I mentioned, are common in PNH. The clonal expansion is sometimes associated with different HLA uh, subtypes. Uh, the presence of a PNH clone can uh, predict response to immunosuppression. And when we look at the T cell repertoire in patients with PNH, it's usually very oligoclonal. And in fact, more recently, uh, let me go through a quick model that we think is going on. Obviously, in patients with aplastic anemia, they can have a PNH clone present, but there's an immune assault that knocks down all the stem cells and you end up with pancytopenia. In PNH, that immune assault is less well understood, but in patients who have hemolysis, we suspect that it is more uh, of an immune assault on normal stem cells. The abnormal stem cells are able to evade it, and therefore, uh, you lead to more of a hemolytic picture. In some of these patients, it may knock down those stem cells, and you end up with a bone marrow failure and hypoplasia. And in fact, more recently, we've been discovering that some of these T cells are restricted uh, against the uh, GPI clone, so, or against the GPI protein, so that maybe there is a T cell assault against cells that are, have GPI uh, anchors on them, uh, and that, therefore that leads to uh, this type of uh, response that we see in PNH patients. So back to the clinical picture of PNH. Uh, there's hemolysis due to complement activations. You end up with anemia and fatigue. There's hemoglobinuria that can lead to long-term kidney damage. There is, as you release free hemoglobin into the, the vasculature, uh, nitric oxide trapping that leads to all sorts of pain, spasms, pulmonary hypotension, impotence in males, and maybe fatigue. Uh, we still don't know what causes the blood clots in these patients, uh, and I'll show you a slide just showing the unusual sites where they get blood clots, and there can be bone marrow failure with decreased blood counts and cytopenias. Uh, the hemolysis that occurs in these patients is due to complement activations. Normal red cells, again, have CD55 and 59 on their surface that protects them from complement activation. P and H shells don't have that, and so whenever complement's activated, you end up with hemolysis that is uh, intravascular, you end up with anemia, and because you release uh, uh, certain things, you end up with all these symptoms, and these patients often will feel lousy when they go through hemolytic flares. Uh, thrombosis is the more, most feared complication of PNH, occurring in up to 40% of patients in the old days uh, before we had effective treatments, and it was the leading account, uh, cause of death in several uh, surveys, at least in the, uh, Europe and the U.S., and the problem with these thrombotic episodes were, despite effective anticoagulation, they tended to clot again and again. Uh, and that was a big problem because uh, uh, eventually you clot too many times, you're going to have a bad outcome. Uh, the thrombotic events can occur in standard DVTs, but about a third of them also occurred in the GI tract, in hepatic portal veins and mesoteric and splenic veins. You see cerebral veins, you see superficial veins being involved. So odd location should make you think about PNH. And in fact, I thought that first case where you had a cerebral vein thrombosis and low platelets, you were going to tell me it was PNH and not uh, ITP. Um, again, possible causes are shown there, but nobody has truly proven what causes the thrombotic events in PNH patients. One thing that may be interesting is as you lyse red cells, you release microparticles that are pro uh, coagulant, and uh, uh, as we've uh, uh, been using complement inhibitors, we see much less clots, as I'll show you. Patients with PNH do not do well overall, and this is an older study from uh, Pete Hillman in England in 1995, uh, showing you that the average uh, time to death was about 10 to 15 years, um, and that's not a good thing compared to age match controls. So how do we treat PNH these days? Well, in the old days, we would transfuse them. They're hemolyzing. We'd give them iron and folic acid to help them replenish red cells. We'd put, yeah, steroids were controversial. I trained it uh, under Wendell Ross, who was a big believer in low-dose every other day steroids, claiming they didn't have side effects. I've seen some of the long-term side effects on those patients. That's probably not true. And then we now have eculizumab. 
Uh, for thrombosis, we used to put these patients on anticoagulants, and I'll show you the data with eculizumab. And for bone marrow failure, which is mediated not through complement, we tend to use the same things we use for aplastic anemia, uh, ATG cyclosporin and bone marrow transplant, uh, although these have not been well studied. Eculizumab is the first in uh, class uh, drug approved for treatment of PNH. It was an IgG4 uh, modified molecule. IgG4 picked because it would not activate complement itself and uh, it would bind to C5. And C5 was picked because patients who are deficient, or kids who are deficient congenitally in C5, only get one type of infection, whereas if you try and hit earlier uh, forms of complement, you end up with a lot of immunosuppression. Three studies were done to get to, to approval and a long-term extension study. Um, and you see here some of the endpoints. The primary endpoint was uh, these patients were all transfusion uh, uh, dependent, and uh, it was lowering that tra transfusion avoidance that, that was the primary endpoint. But you can see what happened to hemolysis is just looking at the LDH levels. They fell rapidly and quickly to near normal levels. The median number of uh, packed red cells transfused per patient went from 10 down to zero. That's not complete avoidance. But, and these were strictly defined as wherever you needed transfusion uh, to uh, qualify for the study, that hemoglobin was your cutoff. There was no this... Uh, uh, subjective, oh, I think they need transfusion or not. LDH levels fell, fell quickly, even those getting placebo. Six months after this, they were allowed to roll over in the extension trial, and as soon as they got it, their LDH levels fell. Uh, transfusion requirements went down, but were not completely. Those that needed transfusions on uh, eculizumab were those that had probably a higher transfusion need and probably had more bone marrow failure than just a, a hemolysis going on. So they eventually would require transfusions. Uh, outside of meningococcal infections, the drug was fairly safe with very few side effects given as a 15 minute infusion, initially weekly for four weeks and then on the fifth week going to every two weeks. And all these patients should be vac vaccinated. And quality of life was markedly improved on these patients uh, uh, getting it. Thrombotic events fell. Now, we could not, this was not a randomized study, so we did not have a great control, uh, control arm. Actually, it was a randomized study, but we didn't have a great control arm because it was only a six-month period. So we actually went backwards in time for the amount of time they were on eculizumab and then uh, compared that to when they were on it. And you see the number of clots has, had fell quite dramatically, over tenfold. And that has held true in other studies now looking at these patients long term. So eculizumab really did reduce hemolysis quite effectively by looking at LDH. There was a marked reduction in thrombotic events. Transfusions were, were reduced. Uh, fatigue went up. Um, adverse events were not bad. And there was this uh, theoretical thing that if we stopped hemolytic uh, problems, they would improve renal function and prevent renal failure in the future and prevent pulmonary hypertension. And studies have now confirmed that. It does not treat the bone marrow failure. And it will not completely restore hemoglobin to normal values. So what about survival? Because uh, we've got data coming out now that it's been on the market now for quite a while. Uh, you see our studies and others showing that uh, survival was not great in the past with, with PNH, and patients mostly would die primarily of uh, thrombotic events, which is the major cause. So if we reduce thrombosis with this drug, would survival improved? And now there's two publications out there, this one from the England group uh, by Richard Kelly, showing again a, uh, a marked improvement in survival. And this one, again, from the U.S. group and a uh, consortium of, of people looking at survival curves that are much better. Now, we'll have to follow this for a longer time to see if that's truly the case, but survival has clearly improved with uh, treatment with eculizumab. Here's the biggest problem. About 5 to 20 percent of patients are showing a suboptimal response. They either have continued hemolysis and are transfusion needs. And there's a couple uh, potential etiologies, including still bone marrow failure, Dosing, uh, is it high enough? Are they uh, breaking through? Uh, C5 polymorphisms, which are, have been described in uh, uh, Asian cohorts. There's not been a case described in the US that, or Europe that I'm aware of. Uh, the C5 polymorphism leads to poor binding of the antibody to C5, uh, and therefore they, they don't uh, respond to it. And then the bigger problem I think that's come up is the C3 coating of red cells that we weren't anticipating, but it's been interesting. So from uh, uh, Dr. Hills and Dr. Risitana, this is from Risitana's publication in Blood. If you have cells without uh, eculizumab treatment that are PNH cells, they're going to lice uh, and there's no problem with C3 coating on them. Uh, 
Now that we have these cells surviving, it turns out that C3 is still being activated, and they still don't have a protective mechanism on the red cells, so they're being coated with C3B on the surface of these red cells. And when this has been looked at, it looks like this occurs in probably the majority of patients, but not all of them are getting extravascular hemolysis. So C3 coating will lead to uh, uptake in the reticular endothelial uh, cells and eventually extravascular hemolysis. Some of these patients are clearly having uh, ongoing hemolysis through extravascular mechanisms. Uh, and we don't know what's triggering that. Uh, TT30 was the first of a C3 uh, a complement inhibitor that was developed. It unfortunately, uh, the trial that was designed was poorly designed, looking for new patients, uh, and they never found any that weren't getting eculizumab uh, and kind of went its own way. Here's a variety of new complement inhibitors that are being developed. Most of these are against C5, and the hope is that they will either be more convenient or less costly. Uh, or given in a, a manner that's easier to give. Only one is a C3 inhibitor. That's the one from Apellus down there. Uh, again, concerns about whether C3 inhibition will lead to more immunocompromised states and more infections. So far, the phase one, two study that was just completed did not show that, uh, but we'll have to follow patients more long term. But these are all in a variety of early phase trials, uh, and if you have patients you want to refer to us, we're happy to take them on if they have problems. So uh, in the background there is Dr. Wendell Ross, who was my mentor at Duke and uh, there for a long time until his retirement and left me with a, a whole new field of avenue of, of uh, investigation when he retired. Uh, and I appreciate everything that he did. So uh, we're happy to see patients. And I still bleed uh, Duke blue.